and I just started without unmuting myself. It happens first time that's ever happened. Welcome, everyone. <laughs> Welcome. I'm Charlie Dupree. I'm the rector of St. Paul's Episcopal Church in Richmond, Virginia. And it is an honor and a pleasure to welcome you to the 2021 Linton Lecture Series here at St. Paul's. Would you please join me as we begin with a prayer for peace? Let us pray. O oh God, grant that your holy and life-giving spirit may so move every human heart that barriers which divide us may crumble, suspicions disappear, and hatreds cease. That our divisions being healed, we may live in justice and in peace. Amen. Again, welcome to the 2021 lecture series here at St. Paul's Episcopal Church. As many of you know, typically we would gather at lunchtime during the season of Lent. We would have a delicious meal prepared by volunteers and St. Paul's members throughout Richmond. Uh, but this year has been and continues to be very different. And so our series has adapted to that particular context. As you know, uh, our focus, our theme for the 2021 Linton Lecture Series is journey, journey together. And we chose that theme. It came rather easily to us because for the past year, you and I, all of us, have been on a journey together, a journey as a human race, a journey as a culture, a journey as religious people, a journey as spiritual people. And who better to help us give expression to our journeys than artists? So we've been hearing from artists over these past several weeks, and we'll hear from another one tonight. Um, if you have any questions that you would like to ask our artists this evening, uh, please put them in the Q and A and I will see what I can do about working those into our conversation. I'm also happy to have as my partner in this conversation, Dave Coogan. You all know Dave, uh, he's been with us for the past three weeks. Dave is a member, Dave and his family are members of St. Paul's and he teaches at VCU. He also has his own ministry that helps uh, those who are incarcerated find their voice and give expression to their particular journeys so that's a really important and creative uh, thing that Dave does. Um, and so tonight, I'm, I'm happy to turn things over to Dave. But I have to say, Dave, before everybody got on and before you got on, Sonia was talking about how hard it's going to be to follow Mr. Coconut from last week. Right? It's true. It's true. <laughs> and if you don't know who Mr. Coconut is, you need to find out <laughs> and also find out a little bit about Spencer Reese. But anyway, yeah. Dave, over to you. Right. Thanks. And I will say that, Sonia, if you do uh, have ambition in you, you could bring out your beautiful cats and your beautiful <laughs> cats might bring uh, Mr. Coconut into the running. So I don't know. Cats don't do so well on Zoom. <laughs> No. Well, I see them. They they jump up there and, and walk across um, <laughs> yeah, computer yeah, screens have, a lot, don't they? It doesn't work. Yeah. <laughs> I, I promise I'm going to introduce you in a second. But since you brought up cats on Zoom, I just have to say there's a great New Yorker cartoon that, that cat captures our moment. It's two cats watching a woman about to log on for work, and the, one cat says to the other, "Okay, when she hits that green button, it's go time," and they start oh. running up to the. <laughs> <laughs> this is how our cats think of us these days. Yeah. Okay, but please, before we get too far ahead of ourselves, let me introduce to you to everybody. It's <laughs> Sonia Livingston uh, on the corner of your screen. Sonia Livingston is one of my colleagues in the English department at VCU. Um, her latest book, The Virgin of Prince Street, Expeditions into Devotion, uses an unexpected return to her childhood church to explore the changes in the larger church and in her own life. I've read this book. I can tell you the result is an unflinching look at the shifting Roman uh, Catholic Church and personal concepts of devotion. The book won an Indies Prize for Essays and a Richard Rohr 
excuse me, and Richard Rohr praised it for infusing nuance and generosity into an increasingly polarized religious landscape. Sonia's first book, Ghost Bread, a memoir of childhood poverty has been adopted for classroom use around the nation. Her writing has been honored with an AWP, that's the Associated Writers Press Book Prize, a New York State Arts Fellowship, an Iowa Review Award, a Vandermeer Nonfiction Prize, an Arts and Letters Essay Prize, and appears in many outlets, including Salon, America Magazine, Sojourners, and several textbooks on writing. As I mentioned earlier, Sonia is an associate professor of English at Virginia Commonwealth University and also teaches in the postgraduate program at Vermont College of Virginia, I'm sorry, Vermont College of Fine Arts. Okay, and you can find her most recent work at sonyalivingston.com and that website will be in the chat uh, at some point in this evening. So welcome, Sonia, welcome to our space. Thank you, thank you, Dave and Charlie and Sarah and all of you, it feels great to be here. I've been watching as I'm able to and have really enjoyed the programs already. So I'm thrilled to be a part of it. And I did worry about following Mr. Coconut. Uh, <laughs> and cats are spiritual, but you know, I don't know that it, I don't know that they would work for this. So um, I thought what I would do is just tell a little bit about my journey to becoming a writer, like and then and then focus a little bit more on this um, last book called The Virgin of Prince Street, simply because that is a book that is all about journeying. Uh, in both writing and both spirituality. So uh, in terms of writing, I didn't start till late. I mean, now I think 30 is not so late, but back when I was in my 20s, it felt very, very late. It felt like most writers, you had to know what you were doing very early on. And uh, I grew up in a, a pretty uh, chaotic household with seven kids and a single mom and there are a lot of good things about it, but we also moved around a lot and didn't often didn't have money. And one of the defining um, features of my early life is that my mother considered herself an artist. She is, she's a visual artist and she's really talented. And, uh, but what that meant is that sometimes our the little bit of money we had would go for paint instead of bread or something. And so I learned very early on to, to sort of, um, I don't know about mistrust, but something like mistrust the creative impulse, or at least to rein it in a little bit until things were stable. And so that's exactly what I did. I waited until I had, you know, like a retirement account and a good job and a house. And, and so it, it was in my late 20s when I finally allowed myself to take a creative writing class. I loved writing all along and I did it to get me through tough spots, you know, uh, here and there. Uh, and it was, a, it was a way I expressed myself. But uh, so yeah, so in my, in my, about my early 30s, I um, went back to school, did a, did a creative writing program and uh, really began to uh, more and more sort of turn myself over to the creative impulse. But I don't ever feel like I'm somebody who took a big risk because I made sure that I was on solid ground. Because of my background, I wasn't going to just sort of take a leap. I know the net appears, but I wasn't so sure. You know, I wasn't sure that it would appear for me. So I was very careful. And, uh, but it worked out. I, I, I uh, was able to, to write a, a, a first book. Um, I found that even then though, what I wrote surprised me. I, I think, you know, there's a quote uh, from Amy Goodman, the journalist, she says, uh, go to where the silence is and say something. And I think uh, the sort of writing that I do, which is personal essay, memoir, tends to do that automatically. I also think that's sort of a spiritual impulse too, to, to sort of go where the silence is and say something. But, um, but, I, but I never sort of planned what I was going to write. These, these pieces came to me. And so my first book was about my, my experience of growing up in that household and not having enough money and not having father. And, uh, and then I moved on to other topics that, that sort of similarly surprised me. And they were things that uh, the culture didn't talk about women's lives. But anyway, I thought I worked it out. You know, I was like, okay, I, I, I swapped one career for teaching and I was writing and, and visiting campuses and, and all was good. And then in about, I don't know, my mid forties, uh, I went back to church. So everything, <laughs> this is, this story is leading, okay, so the church is the scary event for me. I loved church growing up. By the way, I should say that 
I was Catholic and the, the little uh, inner city church that we went to in, in Rochester, New York called Corpus Christi was the one stable in, in our lives. It was like the one stable element. We'd move from the city to a farming town or to Buffalo. We lived on an Indian reservation. We lived in my mother's car. We lived in a motel room. All of those things were always changing, but we somehow ended up always back at Corpus Christi. So as a kid, I loved church. So, uh, so when I say I returned, it wasn't that I didn't like it as a kid, but like many Catholics, um, I became an ex-Catholic in my, in my mid twenties. And so when I went back, uh, I was very surprised. And, uh, and I guess that's that, so that led to this writing project, the, the Virgin of Prince Street, Prince Street and, and is what I wanted to talk a little bit about tonight. Um, why was I frightened that I was back there? Well, because almost everybody I knew grew up Catholic at that time in this region of the world, uh, but nobody was anymore because when the church was in the news, it wasn't for anything good, except thank God for Pope Francis. But even that, you know, uh, there's only so much uh, negative news daily about sexual abuse and all of these sort of treatment of women that you can hear. And, and so when I told friends, hey, I went back to mass, I've been going back to mass because at first that's what I did. I tried to verbalize like I'm going back to church. People would say like, what are you doing? What are you doing that for? And I couldn't answer because I didn't really know either. And so um, as in the past, the writing helped me find the answer to some of those questions. And the questions were, why are you back here? Why did you go back to this, this sort of dying city church? And um, wh why do you care that so many other churches are closing? Because that's a big uh, thing that I noticed that so many of the churches in the neighborhood where I grew up are no longer there. Uh, what does that matter to me? If I have so many problems with the church, why not just leave it like everybody else? So those, like I said, sort of, um, led me on these uh, journey and, and, and I'll tell you about the journey from, from the title of the book and then, uh, and then I'll stop talking for a minute and maybe show some slides that talk about some other journeys that I took. But the, the book is called The Virgin of Prince Street and that is because as I was back in that church, I didn't know what I was doing. And I almost every week I would, I would think I'm getting, I'd look up at the altar and I'd see no women up there except for statues. And um, I think, what am I doing here? I'm going to, I'm going to leave. I'm never coming back, but I'd always come back. Like every week I came back and, uh, and I didn't know the answer to that. So I just finally let it go. But what, what happened in the meantime is I noticed that one of the statues uh, that I'd grown up with as a kid, the Virgin Mary, very simple Virgin Mary statue with a blue cloak, like you've all probably seen, uh, was, was no longer in the sanctuary. And so I think maybe I transferred some of my anxiety onto that statue because I suddenly became obsessed with it. I wanted to know, I, 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 in fact, my introduction to the new priest, he said, hi, how are you? And I said, where's that Virgin Mary statue that used to be here, you know, like 10 years ago, 20 years ago. Uh, somehow the statue became symbolic for, for me in a, in, about the changes in the church, um, about Catholicism itself. And so um, eventually I launched a search for that statue. Nobody could say where the statue was um, and I couldn't let it be. And so the book that I wrote, The Virgin of Prince Street is called The Virgin of Prince Street because this statue comes from the church, which is on Main and Prince Street. And um, while the book talks about several expeditions that I took or uh, journeys, the main one really involves looking for that Virgin Mary statue. So I thought maybe what I will do uh, first is just read a little bit from that book, just, uh, just a couple minutes and then um, show some slides that talk about a couple of the journeys that I took and that will, that, be, that will become clearer as I talk about them. And then finally about the Virgin Mary search. But what I hope is that if you have any questions, you'll feel free to ask them and interrupt because uh, questions are always better than slides. Except for one slide. One slide I made is awesome, so. Well, I can't wait to see that. But I do have a question before you begin, sure. if, if you don't mind. Um, the Episcopal Church, kind of like the, the Roman Church, the Roman Catholic Church, they're, they're known as liturgical churches, mm -hmm. uh, which means they're a little bit more ritualistic. Um, some people would call them formal. Um, but I just wonder if you could talk about, is there an asp? And, and those churches are also kind of known for their rhythms. Mm -hmm. uh, the seasons and the rhythms and um, 
I just wonder if as an artist or as a writer, this particular expression of religiosity speaks to you in a particular way? Yeah, I mean, that, that's such a great question. Thank you. I think, I think that maybe the book is trying to answer that. Like, cause um, two things that you said are standing out to me. One is just the language, the rhythm, the sort of feast of the senses. Uh, even if you're not listening, which I often didn't as a child to the words and what I was necessarily saying, that rhythm was gorgeous and it absolutely seeped into me. Uh, it was, you know, we didn't have a lot of books at home. And so probably the best access I had to language was mass uh, and the public library, it's cool too. But I mean, it was, it was really important. And um, as I'm older, I see more and more. In terms of the ritual, I mean, not only is it beautiful and something that um, invites mystery and reverence, or, which were also things that were not, they were in short supply in my experience of growing up. Uh, they also provide a sort of structure that you can count on. So when, when the world is chaotic, well, tomorrow is the Feast of St. Joseph and I know what that's gonna be like. You know, I know that I'll do this and this and this and, and it's, it's, um, it's wonderful. I, I understand that for some people it cannot feel that way. But for me, I think because of where I came from and my sensibilities, I really love that kind of thing. And so, so many of the uh, journeys that I take are exploring rituals like Corpus Christi processions or throat blessings or the sacrament of reconciliation, like any of those things that we do that uh, are increasingly actually not done. I was really interested in why are, why are things changing so rapidly? Oh, although I understand on one level why they are. I was also wondering what's the cost when we lose these things? What happens when we no longer have access to them? Yeah, yeah. One of our presiding bishops used to say, and this is um, in terms of how, at least how I like to design liturgies and worship services. He said that there's a great hole where mystery used to be. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that the church can provide, especially liturgical churches like, like ours is, is to give, create a space for, for mystery. Um, and, and hence my appreciation for this intersection of spirituality and the arts and religion. And they, when they're all done well together, it's just perfect. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. right anyway right. that's all I'll say about that no and I think along with mystery also beauty you know one thing one thing I wrote about because well I'll talk about this later but one thing I write about is that in a lot of neighborhoods uh in the northeast cities but other places too the church really is the not only is it the place where I heard sound and I the gorgeous windows and you know, all this stuff going on this sort of feast uh it's the most beautiful physical space often. And so it, there's just something about this elevating of the ordinary life that I, I find really, uh, for me was really important as a child uh, struggling in a family like the kind of family I came from. And then again, as an adult going through the life. So thank you for that. I'll go ahead and read this and uh, then I'll start with the slides and I hope that you'll ask questions if you have them. Only now, Am I struck by how lucky I was to find Corpus Christi open at all? Parish closures have become common throughout the Northeast as shifting demographics have led to dwindling congregations, fewer priests and buildings too numerous to maintain. As local factor factories downsized or died and the descendants of the immigrants who'd come to work in them moved away, churches in the former industrial hubs of upstate New York were hit especially hard. The Northeast section of Rochester, New York was once home to 17 Catholic parishes, each with its own architecture, history, and traditions. Germans were followed by Irish, then Sicilians and Poles, and later Eastern Europeans, African Americans, and Puerto Ricans. One at a time, neighborhood churches were built and consecrated and filled. One at a time, their doors closed until only a few remained. One of these is Corpus Christi. In many ways, Corpus Christi is typical. Formed in 1888, the parish began in a modest brick building used jointly as a school. The population exploded as new arrivals came west on the Erie Canal and settled the areas east of the Genesee River. By 1903, the parish had expanded into the larger and newly built sandstone church on the corners of East Main and Prince Street. Attendance peaked in the 40s and 50s, but the flush of prosperity was followed by post-war post suburban flight. 
and by the 1960s, the parish had begun its battle to survive. And like other neighborhood churches, Corpus Christi's statue of the Blessed Virgin graced its sanctuary throughout it all. Mary looked on as babies were baptized, couples married, and coffins incensed and lifted from the church. Her features did not change as broad Irish accents gave way to the honeyed cluck of Sicilian and tender rivulets of Spanish. Candles flickered at her feet through the Great Depression and World War II, as telephone lines were installed along Prince and buses replaced trolleys on East Main. She offered refuge as race riots erupted in nearby streets and kept watch during the long years of Vietnam. She was there as parishioners celebrated their annual bonuses, and years later when they came to grieve the pink slips that the factories doled out in their places. She'd outlasted priests and presidents and popes, weathered ice storms, heat waves, power outages, even persevered through the nationally publicized schism that eventually tore the parish apart. After all those years, she was gone, unaccounted for, lost. Instead of letting the matter drop, the mystery emboldens me. I want to know where she ended up. I want to see her one more time. I want to know that her robe is as blue as I remember and her hands are still open after all this time. If Corpus Christi's early history is emblematic of other parishes, then the whereabouts of its Virgin Mary means something too. I know I'm unlikely to succeed and see by their expressions that my desire to launch a full-scale statue search makes no sense to anyone else. But some of the most important things in life make no sense. And whether I'm able to find Mary or not is hardly the point. The point is that I need to try. Hmm. So, um, yeah, so I think I'll show a few slides and I'll, I'll try to be mindful of time. Uh, the, the search for, for, the, for the Marian statue was uh, sort of the first thing that I launched, but the first investigation as a writer, I guess, and as a human being, I wanted to know what happened. Um, but if you go to the next slide, I have some photos from some of the other um, journeys that I took. I called them expedi expeditions, and a lot of them did involve travel. Uh, but when I say expedition, I mean that both as like a physical expedition in searching, but also the writing. The writing itself um, provided a way for me to search for some of these uh, answers to questions. So I went to um, New Mexico, Florida, Louisiana, North Carolina, New York, Pennsylvania, Canada, Italy, Ireland. I visited religious shrines, processions. I explored stories from history, uh, attended mass at the county jail, even a political protest. Um, but I can't talk about all of those today. So I thought I would just talk about a few. And if you go to the next slide, um, the first one that I'll talk about is the sacrament of reconciliation uh, or confession, which is what we always called it. And even as a child, I don't think any of us really liked going to confession. In fact, I think it's really common to hear people talk about how they make things up to tell the priest during confession, which is sort of uh, beside the point, but that's okay. Uh, maybe some people really do uh, uh, appreciate the sacrament, but in the United States and Europe, it's, uh, it's considered a dying sacrament. People just don't go. Even people who attend mass regularly uh, do not uh, uh, go to confession. And this sometimes will shock people who are not Catholic because they just assume like on TV shows that you go once a week and that's not the case. I, I don't know many people who go and I don't have the statistics in front of me, but it's something like 90% of Catholics do not go to confession uh, or those who go, go once a year. And so the Catholic church uh, was had a campaign that they were running to try to get people back to uh, confession. And um, of course, during the pandemic, that's really hard. But I was really interested in this sacrament because I thought, well, I didn't actually, I didn't wonder why people didn't go. I knew why people didn't go because I didn't go. Even after I'd gone back to, to church, uh, I'd be invited to, you know, we'd all be invited during, you know, Lent or Advent to come to confession, you know, to have this reconciliation. And I don't know what the others did, but I never went. And so I was interested in that. Like, why is it that we resist it? And again, if it's a dying sacrament, uh, what does that say about us as a culture? And are we, what do we miss out on? Um, 
So I decided to, I heard about a priest in Louisiana, St. Martinville, Louisiana, who uh, got a, got a uh, ambulance on eBay and converted it to a mobile confessional unit. And he's a character. So he's the perfect person to have a mo mobile confessional unit. And he, um, you know, he, he took the call by Pope Francis literally to, to have the church, you know, to, to be a field hospital, to go out to the people. And so he and his, his uh, community of sisters uh, and brothers drive the confessional. They actually have three of them now all over the, you know, south, southern Louisiana, and they park it outside of bars and music festivals. And when I visited, they were parked in a suburban um suburban sort of shopping mall and they were parked outside of a subway restaurant so people were going in for their subs and uh they'd be invited into confession either by one of the people in the congregation or the, the just looking at the you know the unit itself so i decided to go down there and visit um and you can go to the next slide and then click it again this is my big moment this is like my technical Look, <laughs> I mean the van up here. It's uh, actually you can go to the next slide. I just wanted you to see that it goes all over, uh, all over the the Jesus Cajun country. What's that? Oh no, Jesus is on the door. Yes, I thought, I thought you yeah. Had put Jesus I mean, inside. I thought that was your big. You know, oh no, 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 no. <laughs> yeah, no. It's 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 it's, it's definitely a, a mobile. Uh, mobile confessional booth and I tried to take a photo inside but I have to tell you that things got a little tense after the first couple hours the community was very welcoming but I think that they knew somehow that I thought I would be going to confession in fact I had planned on it I thought I'm going to write about this co really cool situation and maybe this will be my opportunity to find out what I'm resisting and uh, as the day wore on I just didn't go. I just couldn't make myself go into that. I mean, lots of people were coming and going and I was certainly invited, but I did not go in. So I did ride in it and I took a photo and they're the uh, nice sisters who, who help out with everything. Um, yeah, and why I didn't go is that I was scared and that was part of the journey. That's part of what I, what I learned. Um, I did eventually go to confession and that was part of you know my journey is to have that experience and to see what it was about. And um, if you go to the next uh, slide, Sarah, we'll see how, how confession happens uh, in my experience has always been face to face anyway, but this is actually my priest and this is my like that little urban church and or medium urban church. And, and so I went to see Father Bob and um, it was a great experience. Uh, but the expedition was about what is at stake? What do we lose? And I talked about things like vulnerability is at stake, the ability to talk, to sit in front of a person and talk about things that you want to do better. And um, the fact that we don't seem to be as weighed down by some of the sins as in the past, and that's a great thing, but, but that we also have maybe lost the ability to talk about how we want to get closer to God or how we want to move forward on our spiritual path. So that was just an example of one of them. So you could go to the next slide slide and see if I know where I am. Yeah, okay, so brief history of prayer. This was actually near the end. Like I said, I had like 15 expeditions and uh, I wanted to go on a retreat. I was tired and also this retreat in Atlanta, a really great monastery in Atlanta, offered all kinds of great retreats and they had one that was called Prayer in the Image of God. And I thought, that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna go to that retreat. So. I got in my car, uh, left Richmond and started driving that way. Um, and what happened is, I don't know, somewhere in North Carolina, my car just turned off the highway. Well, I turned, I drove it off, you know, I'd left the highway and I, something shifted for me. I didn't want to go to that retreat anymore. And so I got off the highway and just started driving east and I canceled uh, my reservation and figured out where I was going, it was Outer Banks. Um, actually, if you could go to the next slide, that might give us a, yeah, so I ended up at the visitor center uh, at the Outer Banks, and I went in to just say, are there any hotels? I don't, I didn't plan this trip. I'm just, I'm just here, and uh, the, the uh, older gentleman who was there, he was probably close to 90. He was really sweet, but I, I saw him reaching for information on the Wright brothers, and I didn't really want it because I have to confess that I've never really gotten into the whole history of flight or the Wright brothers. Uh, but he, he said, and he must have read that in me. So I didn't seem that interested, but he, he went into his pocket and pulled this photo out. And then he pointed at the little boy who's holding uh, 
his father's hand with a dog. And he's, he talked about that he lived on, that he grew up on the same strip of land. And he said, that's my daddy with his Carolina voice. And something about his voice just sort of broke me open. He was, he was a, it was a tender moment somehow, this history of flight. And so um, I ended up staying for a couple days and thinking about the history of flight, thinking about prayer. In this particular expedition, I didn't do anything like go to a mobile confessional or go to a procession in Ireland. Instead, it was a lot about contemplation and what prayer means uh, and how the history of flight and how those Wright brothers, how they kept trying and trying to get it in, you know, their, their machine into the air. It ended up being a great parallel. Uh, and, and, and it was an, an example of how like an accident or an unplanned thing, like pulling off the highway and missing this really great retreat in Atlanta ended up uh, leading me to, to a place that I'm really grateful for. And then I think the next slide is just a photo that I took that sort of mimics that when I was walking up and down. It was winter time, not many people were there. So it was just, yeah, it was a very different kind of expedition. Uh, and then the next one, I think, is the, the last one I'll talk about before I talk about the Virgin Mary statue. This is the female body at mass. And that little girl that you see, um, in, in the book I call her Justinia, but her name is actually Priscilla. She's an altar girl and lots of Catholic churches, most Catholic churches have altar girls now, and now actually all of them need to have altar girls, but um, some people still aren't convinced about having the female body. So uh, so close to the sanctuary or on the altar. Um, so if you go to the next slide, I will talk about, yeah, so so I, I, I'm looking at this little girl as I sit there at mass and serving and she's just so full of light and life and uh, it's wonderful. And, and I, it, so the essay uh, looks at the issue of women's bodies near the altar. I also write about a time that I attended a mass with um, Cardinal Raymond Burke in, in Cork. And uh, Cardinal Burke is one of the people in the church who is adamantly opposed to women's bodies on the altar. Little girls, he says, discourage boys from uh, altar service and becoming priests and so, he talks a lot about the church becoming too feminized and that's the whole problem. So I, the essay and the expedition really looks at, you know, what's going on in the church, what people are saying uh, and what's happening at the parish level and what it is like to be a little girl and a woman in such an environment. Um, next slide. Sonia, can I ask a question as you're sure. moving through? Um, I just wanted to tie up a few uh, loose ends that I've been hearing as you go. One was, you didn't go into the con mobile confession. Yeah. And then you didn't go to the retreat. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Be far away from that. And now you're talking about the female, uh, the body at, in the church. And, you know, you, as a woman, brought yourself back into the church of your childhood. And I'm wondering if there's something in there. Could you uh, articulate? I know you've probably written about it and I'm just forgetting, but it, right now, is there, is there some way you could describe what it was that was blocking you from both going to confession to going to that retreat and to kind of reconciling yourself as a woman in the church? Yeah, I don't think I've seen it that way because you know what's interesting? I think it just happens to be that I'm talking about these three where I actually didn't do the thing. Although uh, with the confessional um, essay, my goal was really to explore like you know, what, what is it that people get out of confession and what is it that I'm missing? And so I did, I did, but um, just to answer that one, I, I realized that for me, it was about being vulnerable. And I, as much as I liked my friends in Louisiana, that wasn't a place where I was gonna feel comfortable um, sharing what I consider my sins or the, my roadblocks. And so I ended up having a pretty great appreciation of confession, but it really took me not going to that particular uh, confessional experience to, to come to that. Um, the other things that I write about, I actually did do. <laughs> so like on St. Blaise Day, I did have my throat blessed. And I, so I, 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 I think there's maybe a rebellious streak in me. And like I say, I think I put these things together in an odd way. Now, the question about women, that's a much more difficult question. It's one that I wrestle with every time that I'm at mass. Well, almost every time that I'm at mass and I don't have a really good answer to that. Why I think I worked on this particular essay is I wanted to know. And I talk about a time being a little girl at Catholic school. My, uh, my, my principal, Sister Eileen, really progressive woman said, you know, some people think that women should be priests. 
And I said, no way, you know, like, even though I came from a church that was very progressive and my mother lived her life in a way that was very progressive and different, I just couldn't even visualize it. And so I think uh, the essay is looking at what happens in the church, what happens in the culture, but also what happens to us as we sit in those churches and, uh, yeah, yeah, that's a great question, Dave. I don't have a good answer to it, except that they're they're all slightly different, I think. Okay. Fair enough. Yeah. And so this is just that that um, mass that I saw in Ireland. I say saw. Isn't it funny? I say saw instead of attended because it was a it was a visual thing. Uh, it was I did not necessarily feel invited, but it was a high mass. Uh, you could go to the next slide. I think that was just how, how Cardinal Burke sees the altar. Certainly no altar girls in that little, uh, in that actually cathedral. This is a, a, a newspaper clipping from 1980 and it shows three little altar girls. And so my experience is that I was an altar girl growing up. Ours was one of the only churches uh, in the city that allowed invited girls to serve on the altar. And so that was my experience. Uh, and uh, it doesn't mean that it's any less complicated, but women preached regularly and uh, uh, were included in a way that was not acceptable in other parishes, especially suburban parishes. Uh, next slide. Oh yeah, that was supposed to set this up. I was supposed to say, so what do you think happened when the uh, when women were taking an active role? And that's what's happened. The, the the church that I attended was progressive ever since I was a little girl. I was you know nine or ten serving altar, and that was a great experience. It 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 profoundly affected me to be in that space to be included in that way. Uh, but over time, the church continued to sort of push the envelope. Um, or as they see it, assert the right, uh, you know, advocate for the rights of women. And so um, there, there was an assistant pastor who you can see here is elevating the host. She began to hear confessions. Uh, she wore a stole. She did these things that uh, we weren't supposed to be doing or the church wasn't supposed to be doing. Also, uh, gay people's unions were being blessed. Uh, everyone was invited to communion. So it was great. The parish went from a dying inner city parish to a really vibrant community with outreaches that were probably the best in the city. But this is the next slide where I say, well, what do you think happened? So go to the next slide where you think happened. Um, yeah, ex like it didn't last for very long once um, once uh, the woman, the, the assistant pastor, associate pastor began to uh, lift the host. Um, and so that essentially, I guess I'll just say that that parish um, made national news because the, the priest was reassigned and he eventually just refused to go to the reassignment and more than half of the parishioners left with him and they have a new parish now that is much more inclusive. In the meantime, Corpus Christi, the church has returned to its sort of really struggling, dying inner city church state. My question, which kind of harkens back to Dave's question is, why did I end up going back to this particular church instead of the one that is so progressive? Um, and let's see what the next slide is. Yeah, the Virgin of Prince Street. I wonder if I should see if you have questions before, before I talk more about the statue. Uh, there is a question from the, um, from the floor. Uh, this person uh, has noticed that you use the term expeditions which conjures explorers, mountaineers, seafarers, et cetera. Um, in your journeys, did you see yourself similarly? And she, she's thinking about both outer worlds and inner worlds. Yeah, thank you for asking that question. Um, I think what, what I did not say early on is that when I came to writing, I came to the form, the personal essay form, and that's just, a, you know, that's a form that we've heard a lot about. But what I love so much about an essay is that it is an expedition made of language. It's like, I think of it as uh, making a path of words into a place that you don't know where you're going to go, much like these outer journeys. I wasn't exactly sure a lot of the times, especially in looking for this statue, which took me all over the place and I'm about to talk about. But um, the, the writing itself mimics that outer journey, at least 
when it works for me, it does. And just like in the outer journey, I'm not exactly sure where I'm going to arrive. And so I used expedition because that felt like the right word to combine these elements of journalism, memoir, um, forays into the past, and um, trying to make inroads through language. So sometimes the essay itself was the expedition. In, in the case of that, that North Carolina, you know, like prayer expedition, that was totally an interior, you know, that was, that was the, the writing took center stage there, the writing and the noticing and the remembering. So thank you for asking that question. I think all writing is that way and probably all art is works can function that way. But in the, in this case, because I had the physical uh, uh, journeys to go with it, uh, it really stood out to me. Thank you. So I guess maybe I'll go ahead and talk a little bit about that statue. Uh, this is just, that's that, the, the church that I talked about, Corpus Christi in its heyday. And I just want to talk a little bit about when I, when I returned, you know, like, I guess I keep saying a few years ago, but now it's like five years ago or something. But when I returned, this is what I found. It was no longer the dynamic church that I've described with altar girls, although there are altar girls now. Um, so next slide. And there is the uh, Virgin Mary statue, probably in the 50s, I guess. And um, that's a picture I had of her. My memory of her was very different, but I just put, put this slide in to show uh, an image of what the statue I was looking for. Interestingly enough, the statue that replaced this one was actually much more beautiful and much more appropriate maybe because the community, uh, it's a, the parish is, Puerto Rican and English, and this particular statue that is there now, Our Lady of Mount Carmel, really reflects that culture a little bit better. She's, she's sort of a dark and beautiful statue, uh, but that didn't matter to me. What I realized is that it wasn't about logic and whether this was a better statue or not. I really wanted to know where this statue went, and I think, like I said earlier, what I was really looking for is like, what happened to this brand of dynamic Catholicism that I knew? Is this still possible? What is happening in the church uh, you know, all of these questions were, were sort of uh, put, put on this search for the statue. Uh, next slide. That is a, uh, a room in the rectory of, so the, the church is now actually, the three remaining churches in Northeast Rochester have, are merged together into one parish. And they have two priests, one, one is actually retired, but he's just, he's just helping out. And then another priest. And what you see here are filing cabinets and each of these filing cabinets is a closed church. And when I went in to do some research into the archives and I looked for like stuff about my old church, I was, floored to see that, you know, all of these stories existed. It's great that they exist, but that they were, you know, these once dynamic communities are now these um, filing, you know, old filing cabinets. So that's what that picture is showing. Next slide, please. Yeah, and that just shows the name of the church. Again, it's uh, bilingual masses and uh, very, it's it struggles to pay the heating bill. One of those three churches will be closing soon because there's just not, an, not, an, not enough money. And like I, like I say, I was really interested in that. What happens to these communities, which happen to be the poorest communities in, in the city often when these churches leave? Like we talked about earlier, the beauty, the mystery, uh, the way that they can elevate uh, pe people feel. I mean, in my experience, People would fight on our street. Mothers and fathers would fight if there were fathers around. People, people would just not generally be happy some of the times, but when they went to mass, something changed in them. And uh, so again, my question was wondering what happens next. Next slide. This is, I'll just very quickly say, um, so I did launch, a, I launched a full scale search for my Virgin Mary statue. And uh, I, the first place that I went was to a used church items warehouse in Pittsburgh. It is just this huge space loaded with all kinds of things from all kinds of churches. And the, the people who own it were wonderful and allowed me to look around at like all the fixtures, all the, the monstrances, the statues. And I talked about like, what do you do with these things? And, and they refurbish them. They sometimes use them for TV sets or people will use them in a new church. 
But um, they say that they started this business because after Vatican II, when people were getting rid of a lot of these things, they were finding statues thrown away. And it's, you know, it was an interesting place. And it, it certainly had me thinking about some of these things. It was also a little creepy, I have to admit. And I'm a Catholic and I'm good with statues, but there was a lot there and it was pretty heavy duty. So it was a good place to think about some of these questions, like the use of statues for devotional uh, purposes. Next slide. Yeah, and so then I, um, I actually got a tip. <laughs> I make it sound like a crime. I got a tip. I got a lead on my Mary. I found that she was in Buffalo. Nobody wanted to tell me where, you know, the Diocese of Rochester didn't maybe want to admit that they sold things from churches that are empty. And I don't think anybody wants to hear that, that things are sold or thrown away. And so when I'd asked, you know, where do you think they were I mean, they were also dealing with other things. The diocese has just filed bankruptcy recently because of all the sexual abuse claims. So they have a lot going on and they didn't want to talk about this statue, but that was part of it. I think that nobody knows quite what to do with these things. And the church that's going to close, that's part of my parish is this huge old German church loaded with gorgeous stained glass and all kinds of things. Where does it go, you know? So I went to Buffalo, I actually, um, then I knew I was far gone. Like, what am I doing? I took 10 days. I went to Buffalo. I, I didn't think that uh, my Virgin Mary statue would be in any of their churches because Buffalo has lost about 70 uh, Catholic churches as well. So they have their own surplus of statues. It didn't really make sense to me that she would be there. But um, I, I went and it was part of my journey to go to these churches. I just took some photos of the statues that I found, none of them her. And if you go to the next slide, I think that's what we have there. Yeah, more. And it was interesting to see them all, depending on the, you know, the, the history of the church or the ethnic groups represented, the statues would be different. But essentially, uh, the statue that I was looking for was not there. And there are a lot of, it was right before Christmas. I don't know if I said that. It was blizzard season in Buffalo, New York, about a week before Christmas. So there were a lot of Virgin Marys around. I think, I don't know if anybody's done this study, but I would say that Buffalo, New York probably has more Virgin Marys per capita than any other city. They were outside in bathtub grottos and all, all over the place, but I didn't, of course, find her. And the next slide, see what that even is. Yeah, so um, essentially I, uh, after about 10 days there, I went to the cathedral. I had this moment of sort of giving up and going, what are you really doing anyway? And does it really matter? And maybe the thing is, you know, maybe the statue is not what this is about. And that is certainly true. And that is what the essays in the book, I think, uh, track. But um, when I re returned to Rochester from Buffalo, actually, as I was pulling off the thruway, I got uh, a text from a secretary at a church. I, oh, what I didn't say is I put Facebook posts looking for this statue. I emailed all the priests in the Diocese of Buffalo. I'm sure that they were not happy with me right before Christmas, saying, do you know this statue? And some of them helped Help. They, they, you know, they shared the post or whatever. So this secretary uh, said, I love Our Lady and I hope you find her. And do you know about the Buffalo Religious Arts Center? And the Buffalo Religious Arts Center is just an empty church that a person has, a woman has uh, purchased and she goes around buying um, used church items that she thinks should be saved. And they're not just from Catholic churches, they're from, you know, temples, all kinds of different interesting artifacts that are saved, at, um, saved because of her. Anyway, uh, the long story short is that I make an appointment to go into her place. I call her up, say, you know, do you have any Virgin Marys from Rochester? Yes, she has three. And then I, I go there and uh, of course I do find my Virgin Mary. If you go to the next statue or next uh, slide, we have a picture of her from this uh, side. Um, and then very quickly, I thought I'd read another excerpt and see if you have questions. Does that work okay? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, uh, this is from the end. Uh, the problems in the church are undeniable. I do not let my appreciation for tradition blind me to its abuses and faults, but neither do I let my anger and disappointment rob me of its riches. The aspects of Catholicism that sustain me are rooting and teaching things more vital than the institution that houses it. And it's the institution that's dusty, the institution that's in peril, the institution that must be renewed if it's ever again to thrive. Looking for Mary helped me to understand that although people and places that matter the most are flawed, often maddeningly so, this need not sway my concern for them. 
Devotion is less about where it's bestowed than the disposition of the one who does the bestowing. As much as I cherish the church and its people, I sometimes wonder if where I returned was as important to the, as the fact that I returned to anything at all. Devotion alone may not translate to transformation. Certainly many swaddle themselves in ritual in lieu of a more challenging or dynamic spirituality. But it's equally true that many of us have been too quick to dismiss it as an essential entry point in our attempt to build meaningful lives. No matter what you call it, dedication, commitment, sacrifice, it boils down to loving someone or something other than ourselves, often against reason, so much that we're willing to set personal preferences aside. This doesn't mean submitting to tyrants or fanaticism or blindly following massive unthinking crowds. It requires nuance and patience and the capacity to withstand doubt. It must be given willingly and decided for ourselves. This is a legacy of Corpus Christi. The men and women who left mothers in Palermo and uncles in Limerick to cross an ocean to try for better lives built thousands of churches in their adopted cities of Syracuse and Pittsburgh and Buffalo. They woke early to help lay the bricks with their own hands before going off to work full days in railroad yards or building canals. They broke themselves in some cases to build the same churches that now sit empty or have become condos or weedy lots. Sad, yes, heartbreaking even, but it took a search for a statue to help me see that their devotion wasn't about bricks or even doctrine so much as their ability to look beyond individual concern toward the common good. It was about creating spaces in which they could come together to elevate and consecrate the ordinary life. So while I will always have a soft spot for the gentle lady I looked to before I could even talk, on Sunday, I'll return to the church on the corner of East Main and Prince Streets. The pews will not be crowded. The stone exterior will have darkened. The fixture, fixtures may be in need of repair. The faces I once loved will have mostly disappeared. I may feel at some point like turning around and walking out the door. Instead, I'll sing a psalm and rise with the others for communion. Instead, I'll approach the right side altar and stand before whatever image of Mary I find. Instead, I'll bring match to candle and make a little light right there. Hmm. That's beautiful, Sonia. Thank you. Landing. Um, I, I've been holding up a bunch of questions now, and I, I, I don't know if I can hold them anymore. So <laughs> <laughs> I want to just reflect on, on um, this triumphant scene here uh, where you come back to church and, and you figure out the difference between the teachings you said that and the, the devotional practices versus the institution and the doctrine. And so there's this part of you that's returning in memory back to yourself as a kid who did stare at that statue, who lit those candles, um, who saw the church as a place of stability and a place of beauty and wonder. Um, and then there's the, the person who's writing about them, remembering those things, but from a different angle or a, a mature self or just a just time passed, however you want to say it. And we know that memory is tricky that way, that you're not really recovering yourself back then, but you're constructing yourself out of, out of the episodes you remember based on where you are now in life. And so where you are now in life is trying to wrestle with these questions of, of what happens to, to faith, what happens to devotion, what happens to Catholicism. And I, I wanted to just say all that as a way of getting to a much more simply phrased question in the Q&A where somebody asked how you would describe your faith community now. And I, I think there's a way in which your return to uh, Corpus Christi is a return to your faith. But given what I just said about memory and the complexities of time passing and what you yourself have said about uh, the role of women in the church and the different scandals, I'm wondering if you could say a little bit more about what you learned from this journey about your faith. Yeah, I think I, well, I, I was first of all startled that faith mattered so much to me. That's what I probably haven't clearly articulated. That was the big takeaway. Just before I came back, I would have never, I didn't think of myself, even though I attended and loved church as a kid, I didn't really, uh, I didn't use the word God, for instance, very, very often or comfortably. And so uh, that's the, that's the number one takeaway. The other takeaway is that I won't, um, I won't miss out on the things that I love because of the things that I don't. 
and that that is difficult sometimes, but I feel better for having learned that. Um, that being said, I do supplement this little church with other things. When I'm in Richmond, I go to St. Stephen's Compline service. And um, there's, a, there's a group of women and lay people in Rochester who write uh, homilies and publish them online. So they're underground because what's happened is that women who used to be able to preach because of a new bishop, that, that can't happen anymore. And so I've sometimes written reflections. Uh, Richard Rohr, I don't know how, how well you know him, but he's sort of this amazing uh, Catholic priest who's really launching a movement about renewal in, of Christianity by looking at some of, some of the past that we tend to skip over that has to do with um, speaking truth to power and that kind of thing. Uh, so I don't know what kind of answer this is, but my main takeaway is that uh, I do, my faith feels like an important thing and I can claim it as such. I think I was probably always spiritual in some way and the writing was certainly part of that, but I love being able to go to church. I love my community, even when I don't get them some of the times, you know. Would it be safe to say then in conclusion that you absorbed your faith as a, as a kid? Like so much of us, when we, when we grow up, we don't, we can't articulate. Like you say, I can't say God or I can't go to confession or you have different perspectives on it, but you must have absorbed something. It must have, that was a place of stability and beauty and, and wonder, but yeah. it must have taught you something that you- I looked. think it, yeah, I think faith in the goodness of the world. I would have used that language, right? But I don't think because of where I came from, I don't think I could let myself believe in that big pipe dream about God or all this. And I think that, right, the adult now can look back and say, well, however I articulated it, you're right, I did absorb something. And obviously it matters because as I hit middle age, I knew that, hey, I, I, I'd made my life what I thought I couldn't do. I'd done these things, I'd written books and da, 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 da. But I needed more. And that more had to do with going to church and I didn't understand it, but it ended up being the thing, exactly the thing that I needed to do, even though it is still confusing. Mm -hmm. I have a, 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 I'm looking at the clock, so we're going to need to wind down, but I do I have to ask you, you, you went all over the place looking for this Mary, this figure that you had stared at all of those hours in church, and you went, did these crazy things to find her. Um, when you saw her, yeah, what happened? Yeah, it was, it was sort of, I just sort of landed that in this talk, right? Yeah, I felt very moved. I felt very moved. And it was, um, it was just because she was a, such a fixture. And Mary herself is such an interesting, as a young woman, I wanted nothing to do with the Virgin Mary. She's this submissive woman who, you know, sort of has a baby without having sex. What is that, you know? But now I saw the open hands, I saw the peace, I saw the serenity, and it was wonderful. And some people say, well, did you bring her home with you? And uh, she's life-size, so no. But there's a little plaque, the, the woman who runs the, the museum put a plaque there talking about the book. So she's connected to the church, uh, and she, you know, in a visible way now, which is great. Come on, life-size, That why was that an obstacle? <laughs> right. If I really loved her, I should have had a pickup. You're right. You're right. Uh, Sonia, any, any, let's have one more question or closing words and then we'll need to wrap it up. I was just going to say it's a beautiful story of devotion. And I, I think a, a lot of people can identify with that, that what you learn through your body, through these repeated prayers or the viewing of the art, the music, it somehow gets into us in a way that the rational mind can't. And I think that your story really illustrates that beautifully. You put your body in motion, you figure out where can I go to find out who I am in this faith and you can find it. And so that's, um, you're, you're illustrating uh, very nicely uh, the, the theme that we've set out in this Lenten series um, about the connections between writing and art and the spiritual journey. So thank you for that. Well, thank you for saying it that way. That's that's exactly right. That 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 reliance on the thing, that doubt is in direct proportion to the reward, at least in my experience of these of these expeditions and putting yourself out there. So thank you for letting me part of your community's uh, Lenten journey. It means means a great deal. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and I don't think you ever quite answered the the, the question from one of our most beautiful faithful parishioners. Uh, to describe your current faith community. 
Oh, well, uh, my current faith community is I still attend that church in, in Rochester when I'm there. And uh, is that what you mean by faith community? Mm -hmm. I also, there, there's a, it, it's a little complicated, but this Richard Rohr has a, a, a large uh, community of Catholics and a lot of Episcopalians actually. And uh, he has something him at our church, yes. Yeah, so he's got a, something called the Living School, the Center for Action and Contemplation. So I've gone through that Living School and I have a community through that as well, which has been really wonderful and getting to learn from him. And, and Cynthia Bergeau is another teacher in that program. So uh, the community feels like it's wider than that little parish, but that feels like my heart community. Like I say, even when it's hard and it doesn't make sense. Yeah. And we've certainly had to experience different expressions of community over the last year. Mm -hmm. Crazy. Sure. All right. Well, everyone, thank you, Dave, as usual. Thank you for being here, Sonia. This was lovely, lovely, lovely. Thank you. Um, and uh, folks, we've got next week, and it, it's our last, it's our last Lenten lecture. I can't believe it. Uh, our, our lecturer, our speaker is going to be uh, Douglas Powell, also known as Roscoe Burnham's. And he is a spoken word artist. He is a comedian. He is a poet. He is a father. He is a husband. Um, and he, he loves to work with kids. So I'm excited for what he's going to bring uh, to the table next week. And he is uh, Richmond's first poet laureate. So I hope you will join us next week. Apparently, before you sign off, though, let, let me just repeat what's in the chat. If any of you are interested, Sonia's website is in there, sonialivison.com. You can learn more about that book, the first book she mentioned, and anything else about her. And hey, when COVID is over, you can come see her with me up at VCU sometime. Yay. We'd be happy to come talk with you there. Or maybe it's Saint, maybe she'll visit St. Paul's. I'd love to. Maybe. Yeah. You are invited officially. <laughs> I'll be there. Thank you. <laughs> all right, you all. Have a beautiful, beautiful night, a beautiful weekend. Uh, we will see you next week. All right. Thank Bye -bye. you.